All right, it is now 2.02. We've got a lot of information to cover, so I think we are going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Just Fields, Elevate Your Land Reuse Initiative with Environmental Justice Funding. Uh, we're so happy that you're joining us on this webinar today. Um, I'm thrilled to, uh, to be here with you and to talk about this important issue of looking at Crown Fields funding and some of the new environmental justice funding and looking at some of the overlaps and intersections. So we're going to get started in just a second. I want to go over a couple of housekeeping items first. Uh, this webinar is an hour and a half, scheduled for an hour and a half, with the final 15 to 20 minutes reserved for Q&A. Um, this session is being recorded, uh, and the slides, the PDF slide deck, and the recording will be sent to you in a follow-up email early next week. You can use the question box um, in your in your Zoom dashboard. Uh, you can use the question box to ask questions and also keep an eye on the chat um, throughout the webinar where we will be posting some links and resources that align with the content we discussed. Um, and finally, please take a moment to respond to the evaluation questionnaire that will pop up at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, your responses really go a long way to helping us develop uh, informative and impactful land reuse programming. So I'm going to jump right into it and introduce our speakers for today. So I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Claire Weston. I'm the Senior Programs Manager at the Center for Creative Land Recycling. I will be your host and moderator and uh, presenting a few slides here today on this webinar. And joining me today are my friends and colleagues, uh, Jalisa Gilmore, the Senior Manager of Environmental Justice Programs at Groundwork USA, who will be re representing the National Brownfields Coalition today, Jerry Minor Gordon English, the Grants Management Team Leader with EPA Office of Brownfields and Land Reuse, Alexandra Gallo, Special Advisor to the EPA Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights, and Gabby Plotkin, Grant Specialist also at the EPA Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. Not displayed here, we also have uh, Marisa Valdez, um, also from the EJECR, um, and she'll be discussing the Thriving Community Subawards, and we also have some representatives, representatives from EPA's Office of General Counsel, including Jim Drummond, Kelsey Binder, Lucille Leem, um, who will support the Q&A portion of this webinar. So here is our agenda for today. This webinar follows a three-part structure. Um, first, we'll dig into the why. Why are we talking about this now and why is it important? Next, we'll look at the what. What are the brownfield reuse and environmental justice funding opportunities and resources that are available? And finally, we'll take a look at the how. How do you utilize brownfield and environmental justice funding and resources to support your community revitalization initiatives? Now, without any further ado, because we have a lot to dive into, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Jalisa, who will present the why portion of this webinar. Please take it away, Jalisa. Thanks, Claire. So hi, everyone. I'm Jalisa Gilmore. I'm the Senior Manager of Environmental Justice Programs at Groundwork USA, where I manage our Groundwork USA Brownfield Technical Assistance Program. And I'm speaking today on behalf of the National Brownfield Coalition, where I'm the new co-chair of, of the Environmental Justice and Public Health Committee. Next slide. And so the National Brownfields Coalition is the only national bipartisan membership organization dedicated to advancing legislation and policy initiatives to support the equitable and sustainable redevelopment of brownfields. The coalition includes members who are leaders in both the public sector and industry, including consulting and law. And the coalition is co-managed by Smart Growth America and the Center for Creative Land Recycling. The coalition has an active committee structure, including a policy, education, and environmental justice committee. And I co-chair the environmental justice committee. So the policy priority right now, the focus of the National Brownfield Coalition is to advance the Brownfield Redevelopment Tax Incentive Reauthorization Act. And this bill would allow taxpayers to fully deduct the cost of cleaning up contaminated property in the year that the costs were incurred. 
We also offer educational opportunities and the link to the National Brownfields Coalition website is on the chat, is in the chat and it's also on the slide. Um, and yeah, we would welcome new members and encourage you to reach out to us to express interest or share ideas for future programming. And you can contact the National Brownfield Coalition through their website um, with the button that says contact us. Next slide. So as a member of the Environmental Justice and Public Health Committee, a priority for me is advancing environmental justice in Brownfield's land reuse work. Communities of color and low-income communities throughout the country are more likely to live near refineries, power plants, and other polluting infrastructure, and less likely to have access to environmental amenities like trees and green space. And this is more likely to lead to a higher risk of premature death and chronic illnesses like asthma, cancer, and heart disease. And so a history of intentional and unintentional policies and practices led to these conditions today. Even communities that were redlined are more likely to be hotter and wetter than communities who were not. And so brown fields are no different. There's an S the EPA estimates that there are about 450,000 brown fields in the US and they're predominantly located in communities of color and low income communities. And so advocating for environmental justice is a way to begin to address these past and present injustices and create healthier communities. Next slide. And so what is, what is a brownfield? The EPA defines a brownfield as property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant. And so brownfields and land reuse sites are usually vacant or abandoned um, sites where there's uncertainty around the potential chemicals or pollution or chemical pollution or current uses that adds extra challenges to, to redeveloping the, this land. And so next slides, brownfields can be sites where there was illegal dumping, um, former dry cleaners, um, former rail facilities, automotive repair, gas stations and fuel storage, even agricultural land um, and facilities, manufacturing and industry, um, and residential property. Next slide. And so the idea is really they're determined by their, their past use. So how did they, they come to be? So we talked about it a little bit, but there are many ways that brownfields came to be. But some of the common reasons are mainly because of our country's industrial history and land regulations that put certain uses in certain neighborhoods. And at the same time, when those, those industries moved out or shut down, those properties were left abandoned and communities sometimes polluted. Um, but also squatting, unregulated land use, vacancy, abandonment, tax title, um, structure fires, and just the practice of illegal dumping um, in general. Next slide. And so why is this a concern? Why does this matter? Um, brownfields. So I mentioned they're over estimated to be over 450,000 brownfields. And, you know, there's their potential sources of land, water, and air pollution to the communities that, that they're located in. It also hinders um, investment in neighborhoods that have long, fa long faced um, marginalization. It also per perpetuates vacancies, eyesores, more illegal dumping, and then it really detracts from neighborhood pride, sense of place, quality of life, health and safety, and well-being. But at the same time, there's also plenty of benefits that come with brownfield transformation, with the cleanup and reuse of these sites. And so when you transform these brownfields, you actually do remove um, potential and actual sources of land, water, and air pollution. You can improve public health and safety. There's research that shows cleaning up vacant lots can reduce crime in neighborhoods. You also beautify the existing landscape and you can increase property values. Um, 
And then you're also increasing community resilience. I think we all know that, you know, climate change is affecting these same communities that are suffering from polluting infrastructure and being able to take this land and build with climate resilience in mind is a, a huge um, plus. And then spurring job creation. I think we all know economic development is really important and brownfields redevelopment can create local jobs, um, you know, not just for cleaning up the brownfields, but also the construction on these sites, and then also whatever you decide that end use is. We can go to the next slide. And so, yeah, the end uses, they can, they can span, you know, from parks to community gardens, to office spaces, you can use them as sites for renewable energy, um, affordable housing, commercial space, more trees and green space, but also arts and cultural venues and, and much more. And so environmental injustice, environmental justice and brownfields to kind of relap recap, we know that brownfields are predominantly located in communities of color and low income communities, and really being able to transform these spaces can actually mitigate past land reuse injustices. And the residents in these communities are the ones who have dealt with the consequences of these sites, and they should really be able to take advantage of the environmental health, social and economic benefits that reusing these sites will bring especially because there's other economic, social, and environmental um, um, issues that these communities usually have to, to deal with. And just want to mention that equitable development is, is a great way to think about land reuse and really centering people within the process of redeveloping a space and making communities more healthy and vibrant. And so the moment really is now. There's historic levels of federal funding from EPA's Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization and the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. And there's really a strong prioritization of policy and action that addresses environmental justice issues, but also climate change issues that really can support equity-centered brownfield transformation. And so this funding really creates a pathway to create healthier, resilient, and just communities now. And so with that, I will pass it to Jerry from OBLR. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Jerry Minor Gordon English. I'm with the Office of Brown Fields and Land Revitalization based in Washington, D.C. And I'll talk a little bit about the resources that we have available through our program. Next slide, please. EPA's program, um, we focus on trying to address brownfield sites, and we very much value and need our partners to accomplish our goals. Um, we provide grants and technical assistance through our programs to make sure that we are truly investing in communities that are of need of most of our resources. Um, we also help our local leaders transform these brownfield sites into properties and spaces that um, people can enjoy and use. We also promote environmental justice across the country. Um, we have also a specialized grant program that focuses on preparing job seekers for the brownfield labor market. And we also have a component of our program that focuses on supporting our state and tribal response programs. And I should say, I'm gonna move through these slides pretty quickly. Um, so you have them as a reference, but I'm just going to focus on some of the highlights for each of these slides. Thank you, Claire. So I just wanted to share a couple of um, Brownfield accomplishments. This certainly is not an exhaustive list of what our program has been able to accomplish with funds that have been appropriated through Congress, um, but just to highlight a couple here. And these are metrics that we track um, that are reported by our grant recipients, and we certainly recognize that our funds um, do more than just what's here on the slide, that our funds really do make a difference in the community um, that we're able to invest in. Next slide, please. So next I'll talk a little bit about our Brownfields grants, and then I'll talk about our technical assistance opportunities. 
Starting with our Brownfields Multipurpose Assessment Revolving Loan Fund and Cleanup Grants. We affectionately refer to them as our MARC grants, and I'll talk about each of those a little bit on, on these slides. So we'll start off with our assessment grants. Um, these grants are very flexible and our most popular grant opportunities. And under our assessment grants, there are a variety of activities that can take place, um, including doing inventory to figure out what is the extent of the brownfield sites that are in your neighborhood and in your community. Our funds can also be used to identify contamination that is on site and the extent to which a site is contaminated. Our funds also can be used for planning purposes, which is extremely important. Um, we want to make sure that the sites that move through our program are being um, advanced in a way that is very thoughtful, very sustainable. And so our funds can be used for planning for site cleanup as well as site reuse. And finally, our funds can be used for community engagement activities to make sure that the correct stakeholders are at the table having the conversation and it's the community that is driving the decisions for their own community. So we have three different types of assessment grants that are listed on the slide, and the funding amounts range from $500,000 to $2 million, depending on the grant type. Next slide. So the assessment grants that I just mentioned, again, a range of activities that can be conducted, and pretty much you can do anything up to putting a shovel in the ground is kind of how we say it. When you put a shovel in the ground, that's when uh, we move to our cleanup grants. And our cleanup grants are mainly for the purposes of remediating the contamination that is on site um, to the levels that are needed for the planned reuse of the site. And funding for our cleanup grants range from $500,000 to $5 million. Next slide. Our multi-purpose grants is one of our newer products that we've had over the last few years and um, very exciting because you get to combine both activities that occur under an assessment grant and under a cleanup grant into one cooperative agreement. And in addition to conducting the assessment and the cleanup, these funds are also used for discrete planning activities. So the goal of the multi-purpose grants is that you have a discrete area of one or more brownfield sites that you're looking to revitalize. And that is where you're really concentrating your energy and your resources. And it could be one site that then will be the catalyst for other sites that will be addressed, um, but that it would really spur some changes in your community. And funding for these grants is up to $1 million. Next slide. And Next, we have our revolving loan fund grants. Um, these grants are a little bit more sophisticated and complicated and um, do require a longer term commitment. Um, so the other grants that I spoke to, the period of performance is usually, or the grant period, I'm sorry, um, is usually between four or five years for our revolving loan fund grants. Those start at a minimum of five years, but typically we have programs that are set in place for 15, 20 years. So these are long-term commitment grants where we provide funding to an entity and they in turn will grant or loan um, those funds to another entity to remediate a site. And at the bottom of each slide is a link to find out more information about each of the programs. Um, and the next slide will cover our non-competitive grants that we offer to our state and tribal partners for them to establish and maintain their own state and tribal environmental response programs. And the activities that can take place, again, are just for our states and tribes, but they can inventory sites that are within their state or in their tribal land and also support communities. So oftentimes when we here in um, Washington, D.C., in our Brownfields program, you know, hear about a site or we're talking to a community member, we always like to connect them to our state and tribal partners because they have other resources either directly from us or from other sources and are very much in the know of what's going on um, on the ground and can be a great resource to you. Next slide. So next, I'll talk a little bit about our technical assistance opportunities within our program, and they fall into three buckets. Um, the first bucket is technical assistance that is done 
by an EPA contractor on behalf of the community. Secondly, um, we offer technical assistance grants to grant providers. And then thirdly, for our state and tribal partners, we also have a small um, section of our funding that is geared towards technical assistance that they will conduct. So starting off with the targeted Brownfield Assessment Program, which is um, a national program, but it is, next slide please. Um, it is within each of our 10 EPA regions. It is free to communities to access. Um, there typically is a short um, survey, if you will, to get more information about the site and make sure it meets certain eligibility criteria. But an EPA contractor will go out and conduct the assessment. So this is a great resource for communities because you don't have to enter into the competitive cycle. So typically we see communities that are smaller communities in rural areas, um, our tribal nations might just have one or two sites that they need to address in their community that can really make the difference. And so this program is really geared towards those types of projects. Next. On our land revitalization technical assistance, again, this is where an EPA contractor can go out to a community and help members of the community really think through practically how to safely and sustainably reuse a site. And um, there are a variety of different assessments that can take place to help communities really determine what the site can be used for. So for example, um, site reuse assessments or a market study, um, site reuse visioning, if the community needs to come together to really think through what do we want to see um, changed in our community and what can we envision for ourselves. And so funding is available um, as resources allow, but if that's something of interest to you, please um, do reach out to us. Our next slide is one of um, our grant providers um, that we group together, and they're known as our technical assistance to Brownfields providers that we refer to as our TABs. Our TABs are geographically based and provide, again, free technical assistance to communities, and you don't have to be a recipient of an EPA Brownfields grant to take advantage of their services. And so they can help on a variety of topics, um, everything from helping you prepare an application for funding to um, understanding what are brownfields. If you're just trying to get your head around, what is a brownfield? Do we have brownfields in our site, um, in our community? The tabs um, can be a great resource to you. So again, they're geographically based. And then we have one provider, Kansas State University, that is um, our national provider. And on the next slide, um, just wanted to highlight some of our topic-specific nationwide technical assistance and research grants. Um, they have varying um, focus areas and varying availability in terms of when the grants are available to communities, but um, I'll just highlight a couple of them. So our technical assistance to tribal nations and entities is a new grant that we just um, awarded to Kansas State University. Um, as well as our Brownfields job training grants, um, communities that are interested in workforce development can contact KSU. Um, and then I'll also highlight some of our research grants under um, the Center of Community Progress, uh, focused on land banking strategies to support Brownfields and UMass Dartmouth um, that has just recently been awarded a grant to focus on anti-displacement research because we know that when um, we address Brownfield sites, there's market forces that really do change the landscape of the community. And we wanna make sure that those who want to remain to work, to live, to play in a community can do so even after a brownfield site has been reimagined. And then finally, um, our technical assistance grants that are offered through our state and tribal partners on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so these are very discreet in who we can offer this technical assistance to, but our state and tribal partners can select projects on behalf of communities that meet certain criteria um, to assist them in providing Brownfields training, conducting community vision and marketing analysis, um, and again, doing inventory work just to get a handle on what the Brownfield landscape is in your community. 
And uh, as promised, I moved through that very quickly. Um, so here are some links if you'd like to get in contact with us for more information. And I think with that concludes my portion of the presentation and I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Alex. Great, thanks so much, Jerry. Uh, that was an amazing overview and we're really happy to present alongside all of you. Uh, my name's Alex Gallo, Special Advisor at EPA, as mentioned. Um, I design and lead the Community Change Grant Program. Uh, this is EPA's $2 billion environmental and climate justice grant program uh, made possible by President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I first want to thank the Center for Creative Land Recycling for inviting us to speak about this program um, and really for um, being uh, really proactive and, and helping to create an amazing agenda for today. Um, our, our team actually presented at the Brownfields Conference last summer when we were developing our notice of funding opportunity. Um, and so through that experience, we found an opportunity to help fill the gaps in the Brownfield, in the Brownfield space, um, some gaps at least, and allow for opportunity for climate resilience redevelopment, um, uh, among other types of projects available under our program, as you will see. Uh, we launched this program in November of 2023, and uh, this program is available to apply for funding now through November of 2024. Um, I just want to say very briefly before my, um, my colleague goes into more of the details, uh, we've never had an opportunity like this before in environmental justice um, or in the federal government. Uh, these are transformative funding amounts that will go directly to community-based nonprofit organizations and their partners, including local governments, tribal governments, and others. This is also a very innovative program um, in terms of how we've developed it, uh, several different project types available, um, innovative grant making, which Gabby will cover, uh, but it also encourages innovation from the applicants. Um, you'll see that there's a lot of flexibility in what can be done. Um, there are, of course, guidelines and things like that, but uh, in general, a lot of flexibility and what we want to see is creativity. Um, so with that, I'll actually hand it over to my colleague, Gabby. Um, Gabby is our programmatic policy expert on the community change grants, um, uh, was uh, really a lead in designing some of this aspect of the NOFO, as well as our community engagement portions. Uh, so Gabby. Thank you, Alex. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, Claire, can we move to the next slide, please? So keeping that in mind of what Alex said, um, that our program um, and what will be what I'll be referencing today is the notice of funding opportunity or as I will shorten it to the NOFO um, contains all of this information and just as a reminder um, our slides are actually already available online on our website and we'll provide links to all of that at the end. So speaking to what how we designed this um, we wanted to do this with meaningful community, tribal, and other stakeholder input. Um, and so the investments that we're making, um, as Alex mentioned, were really based on that robust community engagement um, that we did over the past several months prior to releasing the NOFO. And some of our goals include funding community-driven pollution and climate resiliency solutions and investing in cro strong cross-sectoral collaborations with partners working for and with communities. This is also um, going to help us to unlock access to more significant resources, especially through our capacity building to support, um, to encourage communities to become stronger, um, strengthen their own decision-making power and also ability to design their futures. And so to the next slide, um, this is just a snapshot of what our engagement period looked like to be able to come up with those goals and design our project. Um, so we had engagement through a request for information online. Um, we consulted with members of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council who provided robust recommendations for us on how to improve grant making at the federal level. Um, we engaged EPA staff across regions and in headquarters. Um, and we even went out and visited different communities uh, to speak with them about particular issues uh, including brownfields, to see how those looked at a community by community level. Next slide. 
So what we came to is that we really need to have a different approach to be able to reach communities through environmental justice. And that is through our holistic systems level framework that integrates people, infrastructure, and can tackle multiple community priorities at once. So what you'll see in our projects is the ability to have multiple projects essentially in any application um, to try and change the community at large. And we're also um, updating and transforming our grant making process uh, in the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights so that we can share those best practices with other groups across the agency. Next slide. So our program is broken down into two tracks. Our first one are implementation focused um, grants. These are called our Community Driven Investments for Change, or I'll refer to them as track one. This is where the majority of our $2 billion will be. Um, and grant sizes are looking around 10 to $20 million each. So that um, is where you can estimate what the total project, the total cost, excuse me, of your project would be. I'll also speak about track two, which focuses on meaningful engagement for equitable, equitable governance. And these are our smaller projects, um, but not smaller impact. They're focused on uh, our community engagement and helping to improve outcomes for communities at the decision-making level. And those would be one to $3 million in total project costs. Next slide. So as part of this, we have um, multiple forms of technical assistance that have been built into our budget within the Inflation Reduction Act so that we can ensure that we have the best applications and that communities are supported to be able to structure their programs. Um, our first one is our specifically designed community change technical assistance. Um, and you can find more information about that online. They're putting on workshops uh, along with EPA to focus on deep dive topics, in addition to individual one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to help with pieces of the pre-application um, period. So putting together your application, engaging communities, focusing on different um, requirements within the notice of funding opportunity. Um, we also have our equitable resilience technical assistance, which is more tailored toward disaster um, areas. Uh, so these are areas facing um, intense natural disasters and we have some more information in the NOFO and online about how to qualify for that. And finally, we have our Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers, um, which focus on more generalized technical assistance across EPA. Alex will provide some additional information. Yeah, thank you so much, Gabby. I just wanted to provide um, yeah, uh, some background context um, specifically for our main form of TA, the Community Change Technical Assistance Program. Um, we launched this program, we began to launch it at the same time that we released the Notice of Funding Opportunity. And so um, this is a separate third-party entity who are serving as the TA providers um, because EPA staff cannot be so involved in a, a competition and speaking with applicants directly. Um, but there has been a, a huge backlog um, in terms of and oversubscription in terms of TA requests from potential applicants. Um, so I just want to folks to be aware if you have requested TA through the CCTA program and you haven't heard back yet, um, they are taking a little bit longer than expected to respond. Um, but if it is taking a while, feel, please feel free to email the CCGP uh, program directly at the end of this PowerPoint, there will be an email and we can try and troubleshoot that for you. But the best thing to do is to contact EPA directly to try and troubleshoot if you have not heard back from the TA providers. And just in advance, we thank everyone for your patience as we try to stand up um, this program. EPA typically doesn't have technical assistance programs for its grant programs. Um, Brown Fields is, of course, an anomaly, but um, in generally speaking, um, it, it's rare. And so we're trying to our best to stand up this program. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Next slide. So who is this program designed for? It's for disadvantaged communities. Um, and we've defined that at EPA um, under the Inflation Reduction Act. So you can follow our links um, to access that. Um, but essentially these projects are all about environmental justice and catalyzing um, outcomes for communities uh, where they live, work and play. Um, and other ways that you can define disadvantaged communities if uh, your community is not yet um, defined on that map as a specifically um, a community that we can serve by this program, we also are highlighting with this uh, project 
disadvantaged unincorporated communities, um, or also called colonias, or a farm worker community, which might be more geographically dispersed. So you can find more information about that at the NOFO. Next slide. In order to be eligible um, for the application as a lead applicant, you need to comply with all of the submission criteria um, and evaluation criteria in the NOFO. Um, so I'll speak about the eligibility and statutory partnership in a moment, um, but we have some general threshold criteria, including completing your project with, within three years um, and not including any ineligible projects, which um, are essentially around community relocation um, or just for the purpose of scientific research. Next slide. So as part of being eligible for the ap application, um, we have a what we're calling a statutory partnership. Um, and so applicants have to be a partnership of two of the eligible entities. One has to be a community-based nonprofit organization, which is geographically defined, um, focuses on community, has that emphasis, and you can find more information in the NOFO. Um, but the other partner could be another CBO, community-based organization, or it could be a federally recognized tribe, local government, or institution of higher education. Um, and please note, so the lead applicant is the one that applies to EPA. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter which of these entities are the lead applicant. It just has to be one of these statutorily defined um, eligible applicants. Next slide. Now, that's not to say that others can't be involved in the project. Um, since we envision these as cross-sectoral, um, really catalytic projects, we know that it will require the involvement of many other stakeholders. Um, and so these would be considered collaborating entities. So these could be legally statutory partners, um, including those that I mentioned before, the eligible applicants, um, or they could be those that aren't. So for example, if you're doing um, a large project, you might need some state buy-in, a state agency's buy-in. Um, and so they are also able to be uh, a collaborating entity. They wouldn't necessarily just be eligible for the grant, but they could be um, involved as the, in the form of a sub-award. Next slide. So speaking more about track one, um, community-driven investments for change, uh, we have many specific requirements in the NOFO, but essentially it involves picking at least one strategy out of our climate action strategies and one strategy out of our pollution reduction. Um, now, each of these strategies help us to uh, help us to envision what it would look like for a community when they receive this funding and to have this um, catalytic change. And in particular, I wanted to highlight a few um, that focus on brownfields um, that those here might be interested in. So our climate action strategy, brownfield re redevelopment, focuses on redeveloping brownfields, which provides an opportunity to make investments that contribute to community revitalization and resilience, promote economic development, improve public health, and improve public health, excuse me, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So funding is available for acquiring land, but it must be cleaned up land. And I will um, extend upon this in a further slide. Um, but this is essentially about reusing former brownfield sites um, for whatever your community envisions they would benefit from. So it could be the construction of a public park. Um, you could tie this with other climate action strategies, such as building or upgrading a LEED certified low income housing project, um, implementing greening efforts like tree, tree planting or installing low or zero emission energy infrastructure such, such as solar. Um, in pollution reduction, it's also interesting to note that uh, the indoor air quality will touch on, a uh, strategy touches on other examples um, that might happen on a brown field, um, but would not involve cleanup of the entire brown field. So this would be remediating or mitigating harmful substances in a building, such as lead, mercury, pesticides, radon, mold, PCBs, et cetera. Um, but again, this is where you can get creative and combine um, those pieces or focus on those pieces for the uh, particular um, mitigation or remediation tactics that are allowed. 
um, or focusing on a brown fields after the cleanup. Um, we also, I also just wanted to point everyone's attention to that we have Alaska specific strategies and we won't be going into big into detail to that today, but you can see Appendix H or you can watch the webinar that we participated in on our contractors website, which will be linked at the end of the presentation, um, talking about what that looks like regarding brownfields. Next slide. So these are our target investment areas. Um, these pieces, um, which were designed from our engagement process, helped us to provide um, target amounts that we would want to provide for areas uh, that we really want to emphasize as part of environmental justice. Um, so you may apply within a target investment area, but you do not have to. Um, and again, these are specific to track one. So this just allows us to compare apples to apples, similar projects within the same region um, against one another and not against the broader pool. Next slide. So some of this additional information that I was talking about earlier, I just wanna make sure everyone um, can note that on our website, we uh, have links to frequently asked questions which cover all of this. But just a reminder that for Brownfields redevelopment, applicants must demonstrate that cleanup at Brownfield sites is complete or not necessary at the time an application is submitted. Um, so we're really focusing on that redevelopment piece. Um, that can include uh, demolition or deconstruction afterwards. Um, and just that we'll have, we have a place for you to indicate the uh, documentation that cleanup has been complete. And finally, the one exception that we have relating to cleanup would be in our target investment area A. So that's Alaska tribal lands. Um, and this will have to do with uh, projects may include cleanup, so assessment or remediation activities of contaminated lands conveyed through the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, or ANCSA. Next slide, please. Our other track is track two, Meaningful Engagement for Equitable Governance. And essentially, this is focused on building the capacity of communities to evaluate and redress environmental and climate injustices and to give them a meaningful voice in governmental decision-making processes. So we've provided some examples in our NOFO, including an educational or a training program. So that could be a training academy, um, educating your community on environmental justice terms, how to engage with government, um, what do those processes look like. It could be, for example, an environmental advisory board. So including community members um, uh, in an advisory format so that they could provide recommendations on policies or feedback on um, decisions that a state agency, for example, has taken to help improve outcomes. So in this way, we wanna increase the knowledge um, and inform communities about government processes um, while also provide allowing our government to be accountable to community concerns um, and to listen and really take into account um, those recommendations um, and that feedback as they continue to make and design policy. Other examples include collaborative governance, participation, particip participation excuse me, in governmental funding and budgeting processes. So these lead to um, designing programs or projects where community members really have that co-creation or decision-making role, being able to say what, have a say in what is funded in their community or being able to design alongside go government what policy looks like going forward. Next slide. So I touched a little bit upon this earlier, um, but essentially some of the new things that we're doing to increase efficiency in grants and accountability, as well as to improve our process for our customers um, is we have a rolling application period. So as Alex said, um, our applications aren't due until November. Um, and so we've had a year process for people to be able to apply to provide that flexibility and time um, for communities to get ready, um, be able to access technical assistance and then submit. We also have some innovation, innovative evaluation pieces. Um, so oral presentations will be included as part of selections for track one, as well as this um, monthly consideration for our applications. Um, to ensure that we're able to uh, award and select 
um, our grantees along with the rolling application period. Next slide. So this is our slide with our links I was referencing. And again, you can find this on our website. Um, but just a reminder that the NOFO has been modified, particularly to clarify some of the pieces I said today about brownfields. Um, so make sure you're looking at the most updated version. We have frequently asked questions that answer a lot of this. Um, and we have current and future webinars that have been ongoing in deep dives. So for any specific questions, feel free to email us ccgp at epa.gov. Thank you, and I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Marisa, to talk about the grant makers. Thank you, Gabby. Um, excellent. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present on the grant makers. I seem to be missing a slide with uh, an introduction of the Thriving Community Grant Making Program. So I'll just do a brief introduction of the program and all together, I'll provide a website link for your access to more information to the Thriving Community Grant Making Program. We fondly refer to it as the Grant Makers uh, because it is a long title. Um, it's also referred to as TCGM, not to be confused with TICTACS, which is Thriving Community Technical Assistance Centers. The Grant Makers are also Inflation Reduction Act funded, and we're very excited about the opportunity for the Grant Makers to be on the ground. Um, they were recently selected and I'll go over the timeline shortly, but the goal of the grant makers and their selection is to stand up through a cooperative agreement with the EPA and provide resources to the communities directly where they're serving. We have three national grant makers and nine regional grant makers. So they're there to provide those resources as soon as possible on the ground to communities and their partners. They're working to provide that substantial support and oversight and tracking of all awards to prevent waste, to prevent fraud, to prevent abuse. However, these are cooperative agreements and the EPA is putting substantial effort into working with the grant makers and building up a solid foundation so that there can be a, an equal footing of accountability on both parties. Um, the grant makers, they're designed and we will go through the phases of funding opportunities that they have available but they're designed to meet the communities where they are in their journey. And we'll speak to those phases of where it will eventually be accessible for the communities. Um, because as it's been said over and over again, investing in communities is the best way to solve those toughest problems in places with the biggest challenges. So uh, of course, we're working to reach those program objectives, but also ultimately to reach that lasting and meaningful change um, with the grant makers as these cooperative agreements with the EPA, they would be the pass-through entities. So on the next slide, we're just gonna go over some of these high level timelines of the grant makers, just so we all know where they are. The funding isn't quite available for communities to apply to yet. The grant makers applicant application process just closed in June of 2023. Um, they were just announced, super excited, but there's a little bit of a process in standing up the grant makers. So uh, we estimate late spring to early fall is when you're going to start to see the grant makers become a lot more present, be able to provide a lot more information about how each of their programs are working and each of the individual nuances of where those regional grant makers are providing funds for, um, as well as the national grant makers and how they're able to support the regional grant makers. Um, all of this is saying, I'm a very visual person, is by, 20, uh, by 2024, for in the summer of 2024, the grant makers will be able to start distributing applications for the phases of subgrant opportunities that will be available. And it's likely that in early fall, we're going to see the actual awarding of funds. So in the next slide, I want to point out that there's a range of eligible subrecipients for the thriving community subgrants. Uh, this whole list is available on the Thriving Community Grantmaker website, um, in addition to the other slides that I will go over in detail. However, most notably, ineligible subrecipients are individuals, for-profit businesses, and state governments. However, we have a lot of eligible um, applicants for these Thriving Community subgrants that the grantmakers will provide. That includes nonprofit organizations, community-based and grassroots nonprofit organizations, philanthropic and civic organizations with nonprofit status, 
tribal governments, um, local governments, uh, institutes of higher ed education, Native American organizations, uh, that includes, uh, we also have Puerto Rico and the US territories, freely associated states, um, and that includes uh, local government entities and local nonprofit organizations in the federal states of Micronesia and the Republic of Marshall Islands and Palau. So it's quite an exciting program. On the next slide, we look a little deeper into the environmental issues that the grant makers will be able to provide these funds for. Um, air quality and asthma, fence line, air quality monitoring, monitoring for um, discharge from industrial facilities, water quality and sampling, small cleanup projects, improving food access to reduce vehicle miles, traveled, stormwater issues and green infrastructure, lead and asbestos contamination, pesticides and other toxic, toxic substances, healthy homes, um, illegal dumping activities such as, uh, and also in the forms of education outreach and small scale cleanups, emergency preparedness and disaster resiliency, environmental job training for occupations that reduce greenhouse gases and other air pollutants, environmental justice training for youth. So this seems like a long list, but this isn't everything. Again, each of the grant makers that are representing their regions will have a very specific program for the application process in which eligible applicants can apply to um, either one of these environmental issues or something that they find most relevant for their communities. On the next slide, we go into the detail that I'm sure everyone is a lot more interested in, which is the various stages and the amount of funding available for each of the, um, for the eligible applicants to apply to through the grant makers. So uh, as noted, Brownfields also uses phase one and phase two. These are different phases with the grant makers. You can also refer to them as tiers. You can refer to them as stages. These are, really just categories in which an applicant can apply to based off of where they are in their need of the program they're working in. For example, um, phase one, you might see some of the more accessible programs for brownfields type programs. And that looks into uh, anything up to 150,000 for one year projects that looks at sampling, testing, monitoring, investigations, surveys and studies and public education. We do, as you see, have other phases, um, for, but for this brownfield discussion, that might be one of the most pertinent phases that would connect directly back to a brownfield um, phase one. That being said, each grant maker once again will have very specific guidance in accordance to their region and the state in which the applicant is applying in. So when uh, it gets a little closer to the top of the summer, you all can access more information about reaching out to your grant makers and how their programs will be more clarified on some of these details as it comes to cleanups. Um, I also want to note, and very happy to note, that there's a limited number of 75,000 non-competitive fixed amount subawards that will be available for every severely capacity constrained CBO. So I, um, just for time constraints, I wasn't able to really go into the amount of funding that each grant maker is able to distribute, but high level, um, this is $600 million that was just distributed to all 11 of the grant makers across the nation. The nine regional grant makers, each of them receive 50 million and are asked to redistribute 40 million of that back into the communities. And so some of that funding uh, that each of those regional grant makers will have will be to distribute to those severely capacity constrained communities in a non-competitive manner. The phase one, the phase two, phase three, those are competitive. So um, that is, I believe all we had for the slides. Oh, of course, the grant makers that were selected and announced. Um, here is the list of the nine regional grant makers and the three national grant makers. As you can see, Region 7 is a repeat of a grant maker. It is a support from a national grant maker as we did not have any applicants from Region 7. Um, however, that region is being well supported through the national grant makers. And as you can see, the national grant makers are kind of umbrellaing multiple uh, regions and that is the East National Grant Maker Institute for Sustainable Communities will be working closely with regions one, two, and three. 
the uh, West um, Climate Justice Alliance will be looking, working closely with regions eight, nine, and 10. And these are the grant makers. And uh, the National Grant Maker Central will be working, um, that's Research Triangle Institute, very closely with regions seven, uh, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, so that is what we had for the grant makers. Again, I will drop a link in the chat after this so you can access more information on the grant makers. Um, and Claire, I think I'm passing it on to you. Thank you for controlling the slides. You bet. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Marisa. And thank you everyone from um, EPA for outlining um, those resources from OBLR and from the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. You can see here an immense opportunity uh, has fallen, fallen into our laps. So it, let's uh, talk about how to take advantage of it. So we're moving into the third um, section of our webinar today, the how. How do you utilize brownfield and environmental justice funding and resources to support your community revitalization initiatives? So I've titled this portion of, um, of the webinar, putting the pieces together, because really what um, I'm trying to convey in this section, given everything that you've heard from Jerry and Alex and Gabby and Marisa about the opportunities ex that exist, how to do you use them creatively? How do you uh, use them and overlap them uh, to support your land reuse initiatives? Now, this extels, extends well beyond uh, just brownfields and environmental justice. Um, as a concept, this extends uh, just in general, the importance of layering, uh, layering funding opportunities and resources to further your land reuse objectives and goals. Um, now, before I get started, I want to um, provide this important disclaimer that none of the statements made by CClear, myself, during this webinar constitute official EPA advice, interpretations, or positions. During this webinar, presenters may give examples of acceptable projects or merits of acceptable approaches and applications. There is no guarantee that following the advice in this briefing will result in your receiving a grant. Remember, all communities are different you must apply concepts given in this briefing to your community situation. These are competitive grant programs. So I actually really like that uh, that last sentence, all communities are different, you must apply concepts given in this briefing to your community situation. That's exactly what these slides are, are meant to do. They're really meant to uh, get you brainstorming, get you thinking creatively about how you can leverage different resources to advance your uh, community revitalization goals. So um, before we jump into some specific overlap examples, um, I want to uh, re-emphasize the importance of funding and resources layering. We're not going to get into building a capital stack or, or a resource roadmap or uh, the strategy of, of Brownfield's fi funding here today. There are plenty of resources that can support you on that journey, but really just to emphasize that um, the importance of funding and resources layering. Most obviously, it means more money to support your initiatives, right? So that's sort of the, the basic. Everybody needs more money to support their, their valuable uh, land reuse initiatives. Um, second, showing that you have a plan to leverage other resources uh, can make your applications more competitive. So nearly every app, uh, grant application is going to include a leveraging section, a section where you uh, articulate your plans to utilize other resources to advance your project goals, right? They want to see that you have a plan that's going to make it more competitive. Um, and then where we're going to spend the most of our time in this remaining section is um, the importance of staggering or aligning funding so you can maintain project momentum and prevent project stagnation. Um, and that goes uh, throughout. We're just going to cover a couple uh, examples today to get you thinking, but just keep that um, concept in mind. Now, many of you might recognize this. Um, this is from the EPA Revitalization Ready Guide. I um, have it on my desk at all times. It's a very useful resource. I definitely encourage you to check it out. We'll pop the, the, the link in the chat. So you'll recognize this arrow um, and sort of the, the stages, if you will, of the, the redevelopment, the Brownfield redevelopment process. Um, and then here on the right-hand side, we have that broken down even further into, into subcategories. Now, I wanted to show this at the onset of this third section because um, I've sort of used this structure uh, to frame the, the following slides that we're going to go through. So just with that, that in mind, let's move forward. Um, so the slides we'll be discussing for the remainder of the presentation 
don't reflect all the steps in the brownfields redevelopment process. That would be many hours long. Um, rather, they are an assemblage of some of the most commonly mentioned brownfield funding and resource challenges that have some potential to be met or mitigated by the utilization of new environmental justice funding. So that's what we're talking about here. Layering, getting creative, that word has been used a couple times in this presentation, creative. Um, so uh, these challenges have been categorized by the stages outlined on the right-hand side of your screen by the revitalization ready arrow. Um, but you're quickly gonna realize that the number of challenges listed under each stage is a lot lower than the number of steps or actions when it's in each each stage, it's just, uh, it's just for framing. I'm also going to use um, these abbreviations over and over again. Um, CCG, Community Change Grants, TC Subawards or Subgrants, um, that stands for Thriving Community Subawards, just for keeping the slides a little less text heavy. All right, so let's uh, let's dive in it, into it. So from the beginning, um, for those of you who have been in the brownfields redevelopment space for a long time, or maybe you're just entering the brownfield space space and are having to learn their ropes really quickly. Um, either way, you're probably getting the sense that the most successful brownfield programs are built on a foundation of community partnerships, interorganization coordination, and community and robust community involvement. Um, but that pre-work of uh, developing this you know, human capital and accompanying coordination structures, that requires funding. Um, so in order to lay that uh, foundation to be able to utilize the valuable resources that Jerry mentioned, the assessment grant, the cleanup grant, to get to that point, um, some work needs to be done. And so this is where our, our first opportunity comes into, into play. And so there are a number of uh, eligible activities under the TC subgrants phases one and two and the thriving communities uh, track two that I want to spotlight here. So some of those eligible activities that could help practitioners jumpstart a successful brownfields program in their communities include conducting surveys and studies, uh, public education, planning, partnership building, and specific under, specifically under CCG Track 2, education and training and the formation of environmental advisory boards that supports community involvement in land reuse and community revitalization initiatives. So two opportunities to really lay that foundation for a successful Brownfields program right here. Okay. So moving, moving on, you've laid that groundwork, you have that foundation. One of the next steps, one of the most common next steps is developing a brownfields inventory. Um, and uh, Jerry mentioned this, um, how assessment grants, multi-purpose grants, 128A grants, these can support um, this process. And uh, your tab providers um, can also support you in um, doing a brownfields inventory. But it's good to have, op op have options, right? So. That's why um, I'm kind of pointing to this uh, potential opportunity with the Thriving Community Subaward Phase One in particular. Now, I want to reiterate what Marisa said about um, it's really up to the Thriving Communities grant makers to define their individual programs. We're working off um, some very general information about what these uh, TC subgrants phases are going to cover, but just generally speaking, there are some eligible activities, general eligible activities that could go, go towards the development of a brownfields inventory in support of a neighborhood revitalization plan, ultimately leading, of course, to prioritizing a site for reuse, okay? So um, once you've got your site, you've got your site, okay? So moving on in our brownfields redevelopment process, Let's look at our next challenge, complete site characterization. So I've seen this uh, challenge come up a few times in the communities, uh, the Brownfield communities that we work with. So for sites where cleanup is required, um, an assessment grant may not include enough funding to fully characterize the site and ready the site for cleanup. Um, so what that means is that for sites that receive assessment grant funds, uh, they can sometimes stall before cleanup can be conducted because they need more funds to get a complete picture of what's at the site. Um, your tab providers can work with you on, on this issue. There are other strategies as well. 
but just looking to, again, a pot potential opportunity with a thriving community subawards phase one. Um, and again, with it keeping in mind that these uh, eligible activities are dependent on what the grant makers, uh, how, what the grant makers define. But just broadly speaking, there is some potential for the Thriving Community Subawards Phase 1 funds to be layered with an assessment grant to fully fund site characterization, supporting that smooth transition to cleanup, which is ultimately what we're all after, that, that um, continued progress, that main, maintenance of momentum. So uh, this is certainly not um, set, but it's an opportunity that is worth keeping an eye on as more information comes out about the TC subawards. Okay, now moving on uh, further in our uh, revitalization process, maybe we've, we've done our inventory, we've prioritized our site, we've done our assessment. Um, now we're thinking about reuse visioning. Okay, and so reuse visioning, a core part of reuse visioning is that community involvement, that community engagement, making sure you are uh, fully assessing the needs of the community and involving them in the redevelopment process. So robust community involvement requires robust funding, right? Of course it does. So um, that can sometimes be difficult to balance alongside other required activities for assessment and cleanup grants. Though I want to reiterate Jerry's point um, about uh, the fact that assessment grants, multi-purpose grants, 128 grants, there are other resources that can absolutely support and you should be utilizing to support um, the, the community engagement and involvement processes, right? But this is just another um, thing to keep an eye on, another opportunity to keep an eye on. Maybe you want a more robust community engagement strategy that's uh, a little more all-encompassing, not just related to land reuse, but really a full community revitalization plan. Um, keep an eye on the eligible activities under the Thriving Community Subawards Phase 2, potentially which broadly speaking, again, could change based on the grant makers, uh, could include public outreach and education, uh, coordination with community stakeholders to address environmental issues, training activities for community organizations and community members, and projects and activities to spur community involvement, such as the cleanup of vacant lots. I think this last one in particular is a really uh, interesting uh, approach Cleanup of vacant lots is by no means the same thing as uh, brownfields remediation or or uh, reuse, but it follows a similar theme, and um, in my in my mind makes for a really good way to build that community trust and rapport and uh, lay that foundation that we were talking about that leads to a really robust brownfields redevelopment program in your community. Get into a couple nitty gritty. I think of all the. Um, frequently brought up challenges uh, that I've heard regarding um, uh, the brownfields funding and resources. The most common one that we've gotten has been around demolition and rehab. So the challenge being that demolition and rehab are not eligible expenses under brownfield grants. Now there is an opportunity here under the community change grant um, with uh, some important restrictions. So I'm just gonna read this out in full. The CCG can support deconstruction and green demolition activities to support adaptive reuse or new construction on sites where cleanup activities have been completed or not necessary. That last piece is really important. I encourage you to read the Community Change Grants NOFO, review the uh, frequently asked questions to get more information on this. And uh, if you're curious on green demolition, Lorena just popped the uh, Climate Smart Brownfields Manual into the chat. Chapter three uh, includes a description of green demolition. So you can take a look at that. Now, following sort of this within the same vein um, is site acquisition. The challenge being that site purchase and acquisition are not eligible expenses under brownfield grants. So the opportunity um, here uh, comes from both the CCG and potentially the TC subawards. So I think um, this was mentioned in, in both presentations, but the CCG track one strategy six, strategy six is the Brownfields redevelopment uh, strategy, um, includes uh, eligible expenses such as acquiring land to enable a brownfield redevelopment that has emissions mitigation and or climate resilience benefits. 
Um, and then under TC subgrants phases two and three, eligible activities include smaller land purchases and acquisitions that require less than half of the total amount of subgrant funding. So, you know, keep it keep an eye on those two opportunities as well. All right, at this point. We're pretty far along in the process. We're in the reuse implementation stage. We're at the head of that arrow, if you will. Um, and so the, the challenge here being that post cleanup activities are not an eligible expense under Brownfield grants, but Brown, but the buildup, if you will, is a really crucial part of the redevelopment process. That's sort of why we're all here, right? We wanna see the beneficial reuse of these sites. As Brownfield practitioners, um, our job is to transform uh, these vacant and underutilized sites into community assets. So it's all about, you know, getting to that end use, getting to that community asset. And a huge uh, part of that is that post cleanup community involvement. Um, and so, as was mentioned, um, the CCG track two creates a really interesting opportunity to, to bolster this, if you will, by creating a governance body or development community for a Brownfields post cleanup redevelopment project. That is a direct quote from the NOFO. Um, and uh, this is important to do this because, you know, it, there's, it goes towards preventing displacement, uh, maintaining momentum so that you keep that rapport and trust with the community and the buy-in, um, and just generally making sure your process moves through uh, smoothly and equitably. Still in that same stage, um, one of the one of the other challenges that sometimes comes up is um, Brownfields funding. It can pay for planning expenses, and uh, Jerry outlined some opportunities where it does so, um, including like conceptual site designs. But some communities do need to plan out further, um, including architecture and basic engineering to determine development costs. So a couple opportunities here to keep an eye on, especially as we get more information out about the thriving communities subgrants. So under the community change grants, track one strategy six does include um, some A and E efforts that support. Uh, climate conscious and green end uses, and the TC subawards phase three, just generally speaking, um, do include uh, some like project development and blueprints for construction or cleanup projects, schematics, and technical developments. So you can see there how you know leveraging some of those are opportunities alongside um, a brownfields project might um, might make sense, might make the project move forward smoothly. Okay, those were the examples. Um, uh, just some things to get you thinking about ways you can creatively tap into uh, both um, both resources from both OBLR and OEG, OEJ and CR. I wanna um, conclude here with some, some final thoughts. Uh, first, I wanna reiterate that this level and scope of funding has really never been seen before. Um, so, Review your community revitalization needs and priorities. And think about how you can take advantage of this really historic moment because it's it's well worth it. And the timeline is um, it's pretty short. Uh, there's not a lot of time to to get your ducks in a row to um, take advantage of these opportunities. Um, I want to uh, reiterate what uh, Gabby said about approaching your projects holistically, and that really does apply to land reuse. So approach your land reuse initiatives holistically. This means getting creative and seeking out funding from various sources and funding entities. And it also means thinking about how your land reuse objectives intersect with and uplift other pillars of community health and well-being. So including environmental justice, as we've discussed here today, equitable development, public health, climate resilience, sustainability, community resilience, economic redevelopment, they all intersect. So it's good to think about it in that holistic way. And finally, um, both uh, the Office of Brownfields Land and Land Reuse and the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights have dedicated TA providers that can support communities revitalization and environmental justice initiatives. So please take advantage of these resources. Um, we can support you at any stage. Um, and if we're not able to support you, we usually can direct you some, to someone who can. So um, I encourage you to reach out to your TA provider if you get stuck or even just wanna bounce ideas off of them. And with that, I think we're gonna move to Q&A. 
redirect my attention to the Q&A box. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and uh, welcome all of our speakers to come back on camera. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, so I'm just taking a look at some of the questions that came in here. I don't know which ones to tap into first. So I'm just going to uh, go in in order. Please feel free, um, can, or um, all of you uh, listening in, to continue to put your questions in, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so Austin counts. Uh, Jerry, this one's for you. Um, ask the question: Does the TBAs include assistance for potentially contaminated buildings? Potentially, yes. So if you have a site in mind, um, I encourage you to reach out to the EPA region that covers your state. And if you wanted to include that in the chat directly to me, I can connect you with um, the person to reach out to to talk about your site a little bit more to see if it would be eligible for our targeted brownfields assessment program. Excellent. Thank you, Jerry. And I think based on when some of these next questions came in, they might relate to, relate to TBAs, um, but does it include assistance for nonprofits for asbestos, asbestos abatement? I think we're still referring to TBAs here, but maybe just to cover our bases also um, include Mark in that question. Yeah, sure. Um, again, same answer in terms of the targeted brownfield assessment program, since those are handled by each individual EPA region. Um, I encourage you to check in with your local region. Um, in terms of nonprofits, nonprofits that are 501c3s are eligible for our assessment and multipurpose in revolving loan fund grants, um, and then other nonprofits. Um, such as 501c6 charitable organizations are eligible for our cleanup grants. And so, yes, asbestos is a um, contaminant that is eligible under our program. So if, again, you have a site-specific question, um, the eligibility of that site would be handled by our local, your local EPA region. So, again, if you um, wanted to drop me a note in the chat, I can respond and connect you with the EPA region in your area. Hey, Jerry, it's Jim. Sure. I, I would add that for the cleanup grants, you do not have to have federal tax exempt status at all. You can be incorporated as a nonprofit under state law. It's only for the um, RLF assessment and MARC grants that you do have to have a particular uh, tax exempt status under federal law that's 501c3. Yep. So 501c3s. Um, can only apply to multi-purpose assessment in our revolving loan fund grants. But on our cleanup side, you can be recognized by the state as a nonprofit and still be eligible for our funding for cleanup grants. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for that clarification. That's great. And then um, this is sort of a, a two-part question. Does this program, and again, I think relating to TBAs, but let's just include Mark in there to cover our bases. Does this program extend to former municipal landfills that the community wishes to develop, to develop as park and open space? If not, is there a different program to redevelop landfills? If the question is focused on redevelopment of landfills, our brownfields funding cannot be used for post cleanup redevelopment activities. We can use our funding for the actual assessment, um, the cleanup and planning around those sites, but our funding cannot be used for post cleanup development activities. Um, so if your site falls into the assessment or the cleanup side of the house, again, please reach out to um, the EPA region that is in your area. I just don't want to speak for them. Every site is different and nuanced and um, has to be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and this question is for Marisa. Um, for the TCGM, um, could you elaborate a little bit more on what is meant by small cleanup projects? So 
I'll clarify that small may have slipped into that as a kind of subtle note um, within the notice of funding opportunity and what the grant makers are basing the funding amounts off of are the timeline that they are allotted for these different phase one, phase two, phase three programs. And for the first phase assessment, they have one, the subgrant applicant would have one year to complete those tasks and they get up to maximum 150,000. So I think that just subconsciously came in of um, within that timeline and the amount of funding that might be um, kind of restricting the amount of cleanup that you can do. However, I will not speak for what anyone else can do. I'm sure that there are many ways around, um, yeah, a, a restrictive timeline. Thanks, Marissa, Marissa. I think I would add to the, 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 the $350,000 phase three having been working on cleanup programs for a while, you're you're just not going to be able to clean up that large of a of a site or extensive contamination at that level of funding. It just it's just not enough. Uh, so so that that's why this, it, the term small is in the note for to differentiate from the larger type of cleanups that can be funded under the under the Brownfields program. But it, to follow up on what Jerry said, the, the one of the key things is under the grant maker and the other EJ, EJ grant programs, they can fund the post cleanup redevelopment at the site if it relates to certain types of infrastructure as described in the NOFO. So that's the that's where the synergy of the programs are, is as legally Brownfields can't fund the post cleanup redevelopment, but the OEJ ECR programs can. Thank you, Jim. Um, okay. Can't read and talk at the same time. Uh, we are seeing non-EJ or CJ groups forming things like EJ committees just to access these funding. Oh, sorry, just to access these funding opportunities, which take away from actual EJ CJ groups and communities from accessing them. How does EPA plan to identify this and make sure this funding truly goes to EJ CJ groups? Well, that's a big question. I'm not even sure how to who to direct that to. I, I think I can, Alex. Unless you want to address it, I think I can address that. Go ahead, Jim, and I can help fill in any gaps. Yeah, uh, there's a difference. The The way Congress wrote the statute is community-based nonprofit organizations are eligible for funding in partnership with certain other entities. Um, as a statutory matter, if you meet the definition of community-based nonprofit organization, you're eligible. And for us to be able to draw lines based on some objective uh, criteria like how long have you been in the, how, how do we know you it's uh, do this that and the other it would be very difficult and we'd end up with all sorts of disputes over whether people are eligible what we have done and i'm going to turn it to alex now because we're a team is we have put in the evaluation criteria points based on the degree to which an entity can show that they they have a track record in their community They've established, they've established, they have established relationships, et cetera. And so, Alex, I've handled the legal part. If you want to go to the program policy part now, I think it's time for me to hand it off to you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, so we've included several safeguards into the application. Um, uh, and in the notice of funding opportunity, you'll probably notice there are a lot of requirements. Um, several of those requirements are specifically in order to um, ensure that these grants are going to entities that have community-based relationships, have been involved in that community before they're doing the work, and that these partnerships are meaningful. So some of the areas I uh, would recommend you take a look at within the funding opportunity um, is uh, one of which is the Community Engagement and Collaborative Governance Plan. Um, this looks at past engagement done within the community and also um, looks at what uh, what engagement will be done during the implementation of these grants, and then also what is the structure, collaborative governance structure, to ensure that roles and responsibilities are clearly outlined, there's transparency on who's doing what, and also transparency on what these connections are within the community and how those connections will be leveraged. Um, so that's one main aspect of the application, and that's required for all Track 1 applications. Um, and then for Track 2, we um, are looking at uh, using several different resources in order to to gauge 
um, what is the engagement background of these organizations and how they will be working in these communities based on past experiences and leveraging those experiences. Um, so yeah, with all of those, both policy and legal um, sort of components we put in the program, we feel very confident that these grants will go to community organizations who have already done work um, in those communities and have expertise. Thank you, Alex. I have a Alaska specific question. So this might go to you, Jim. Um, when, when will all of these this funding be available in Alaska? Is EPA making this a priority? And if so, when can we expect it to happen? Uh, I only ask because a lot of the funding um, for brownfields from EPA, Alaska tends not to be qualified for. We have a specific uh, target Yes, we have uh, $150 million, dedicated, $150 million. Uh, as, as our floor, not the ceiling, right? So at a minimum, this is our target to get $150 million to um, tribal uh, tribes within Alaska specifically. Um, and so when these funds will be available, as soon as you all apply, as soon as we get an application and it scores well, and that's um, exactly what we want to see is high scoring applications from tribes in Alaska. Um, and so we have absolutely signaled that we want these funds, at least $150 million to go there. And we would like to deploy these funds as quickly as possible. It's all dependent on the quality of applications we receive and um, the, the timeline for getting those grants um, executed thereafter. And I would add the difference between what we're funding under the Alaska set aside and the Brownfields funding is that unlike Brownfields, there's no statutory requirement that the entity receiving the uh, grant is not CERCLA liable under uh, under the strict liability schemes of CERCLA and of some of the petroleum liability schemes that are built into the Brownfield statute. None of that is in the in, is in the uh, environmental justice uh, uh, grant program, but remediation of ANCSA land of ANCSA uh, uh, contaminated land is expressly eligible under that. So it's some it's broader because the statutes are different. Thanks, Jim. Um, we are reaching the end of our webinar. I'm uh, I'm afraid, um, but I hope everyone found this uh, helpful and maybe even a little bit inspiring to start getting creative and thinking about ways to leverage these opportunities. And I really want to um, thank all of our presenters today. Um, an enormous amount of work went into um, uh, this webinar, and I really want to thank all of you for. Uh, showing up and, and really just making this possible. Um, and I, I hope all of the attendees agree that I thought it went really well and it was a fabulous webinar. So thank you all for listening in. You will receive the recording and the slides um, early next week. And um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week and an amazing weekend. And um, I believe that's all. Don't forget to fill out the evaluation that will pop up after we close this webinar. And uh, please have a have a great rest of your day and we'll we'll see you soon. Don't don't be afraid to be in touch. Thanks everyone.